get started and in in between like if uh, there is any disturbances with my internet mic please let me know and also if there's questions yeah maybe we can discuss as well so with that uh, i think amit sir has covered so i'm basically uh, working at perception lab in heat department in continental automotive currently at bangalore so i did my masters in mechatronics but i was actually at csir csio chandigarh where i did my thesis under professor hk sadanas and uh, Professor Aparna Kula. and since then I have been in image processing and computer vision. I have worked in you know, the common projects that you guys might be knowing, like the action recognition, face, iris, emotion, uh, but mo mostly from the automotive perspective, and then some little bit of work in uh, perception, little bit of work in driver perception modeling, in cabin monitoring, and currently I'm working on few inspection topics. Um, so with that, so uh, actually, you know, uh, supervised learning is, is, is very common. So we have taken supervised learning for granted. You know, any any problem is given to us, we try to formulate it somehow or the way in the supervised learning way. Uh, but like, is it the only way to do, or are there better things? Let's uh, let's discuss about that. So this is one uh, thought from Jan Lekun from his lecture. So he was saying that you know today uh, artificial intelligence when we say artificial in intelligence we mainly what we mean is actually we are doing machine learning and in machine learning what we are actually doing is the deep learning part it's the hottest trend right now and within deep learning somehow our way we are doing you know uh, kind of supervised training so but i mean uh, with, with whatever research we did you know we already have good uh, ai applications which are already at our hand so in your home you'd be having this uh, you know this uh, amazing uh, google home or alexa speaker or you, if you're using netflix there are recommenders recommenders recommendation system then uh, it's used in medical diagnosis in shopping in you know photo mail like a lot of applications ai has already you know uh, come at our hand tips and uh, if you see this, this is quite old picture, but you know that uh, ImageNet, especially. So uh, just one remark. So like mostly I have worked in image domain. So I'll be referring in context of image, but I, I think the logic or, or the uh, concept could also be translated to other domain, just that it's easier to explain with uh, images. So uh, if you see this graph, you know, uh, on the image net, there were networks which could even surpass uh, the human level performance, like, you know, the, the ResNets in 2015 and all. And uh, this is from 2016. This was quite popular when uh, uh, RL model called AlphaGo was able to defeat, you know, a human in the game of Go, which is really complex game because the number of possible positions in that game are more than the number of known atoms, atoms in the known universe. So AI has achieved really good feat. And actually, I would also recommend you can watch this documentary. It's a very nice documentary about AlphaGo. So, but one thing that always, uh, you know, uh, comes up front when we think uh, human versus machine. So if you see the game on the right, it's a Mario game. And, you know, basically you would, it would have taken you like uh, uh, one, two, three hours to master this game the uh, ai model they were able to defeat human but they were trained for you know like hundreds and hundreds of hours so you you can see some differences coming here and also say for example the current hottest uh, trend the self driving cars they are trained you know so much on so they're using uh, training data for so many hours and they run tests on you know so many hours and hours and they're running for years but as human you know like we learn driving I don't know, depends, but uh, quite less number of days. And considering any unusual situations, you know, for example, elephant coming in, it's it's not common and self-driving car may, uh, you know, uh, get confused or give some uncertain predictions here, but we are easily able to adapt, you know, with such less time and less amount of data. And as ImageNet, they were able to defeat, uh, uh, defeat human being, but they're trained on nearly 1.4 million images. So, that's really absurd when we compare to uh, human beings. Now let's uh, let's just see a quick example. So that's me, and this is another photo in 2016 in Mohali Stadium. So uh, can anyone comment? Like, well, first of all, where am I? And from this scene, what can you say? Like, what's going on, or or any information? Okay, uh, no, so uh, basically, I'm audible, right? Hello? 
हेलो यू आर ऑडिबल सर एंड पार्टिसिपेंट्स आर प्लेइंग ऑन द चैट बॉक्स आ ओके आई एम ऑन स्लाइड शो ओके आ दैट्स व्हाई आई कैन नॉट सी या ओके ओके के ओके फाइन सो मे बी यू गॉट सम आंसर्स बट या आई एम सॉरी माय बैड सो सो दैट दैट्स मी and maybe i know i i cannot see the answer right now but uh, assume you could have made out that okay we are kind of punjab fans and we are in a cricket stadium and it's a bright day we are happy and so much of other information so just let's just think back you know just seeing the picture or seeing me for the first time not even live you're able to recognize me just one picture and just with one scene which you have never seen in your life still you are able to comprehend so much of information so that's how the intelligence should be and not exactly that we you know train on millions or billions of data so this i'm just trying to lay out some motivations <clears throat> regarding the current trends like that people are trying to move towards general ai so this is another example so this is uh, three paintings from an artist called brak and this is three paintings from artist uh, artist called kesain and this is a test painting and uh, i would like you to guess this is from uh, whose painting so i mean yeah he, i will not see the answer but you can uh, anyhow uh, just think about it so you would have maybe most of you would have guessed rightly it's from this artist called brak so you have never seen this artist you have never seen its painting but by just seeing just few like three informations we are so much adapt to extract so much informations without any supervision that we kind of know that this painting is coming from brak so oh, and also suppose i i put a very new word to you i don't know maybe most of you might be knowing but suppose this is a word called anxiety and i just say you the meaning that it means impatient or restless maybe you haven't heard you haven't used but by just one instance you can you know use it in multiple sentences multiple scenarios and for example there is a forest and i ask you collect as many fruits as you can maybe you have never been in forest or uh, or any such things but if you think like from human perspective somehow we'll figure out that you know in order to gather maximum food we need to chop the trees gather uh, make planks make boxes and in boxes we can store as many fruits as we want so what's happening here so it's not like although i said we just saw one instances but it's not like it's just one instances we have memory like as human and we are very rapid and efficient in learning and we can quickly learn and encode informations in a way that we can use it in any way we want and it, just by seeing you know the trees and all uh, you you may have never made boxes but somehow uh, with our previous information we can bind it to any task that is given to us and it's not like as i said we are learning from just one sample we are learning from the day one the day we were born and we are too good at predictions we can we are basically predicting all the time so when you chop a tree you predict somehow that if i put the ax on the left side the tree are going to bend on the right and vice versa and many other situation you can imagine so these are few traits of human beings that are, that makes us really very intelligent and the people are you know uh, there are so many domains which are trying to work towards achieving this kind of intelligence where we don't have to learn from you know so much of huge amount of data and we don't forget like there are topics like self supervised learning unsupervised learning memory augmented networks active learning continuous learning few shot learning meta learning multitask learning so i request uh, if you have time or uh, maybe you already know about it but you can just go through different research so each topic in itself is a you know domain of research and multiple years of works that's going on i will try to cover few topics uh, yeah and also just try to like introduce you so that we uh, think from different dimension as well so if you know it uh, well and good but if uh, some of us don't know about few topics we'll just have a quick uh, introduction and i think that's the theme of fdp to maybe uh, introduce new topics and also fine so with uh, let's just uh, go back and this is our traditional training that we do you know we have the data we do a feed forward and then we back propagate we compute the gradients and this for this like we take lots of data label data and it takes longer time to learn because it's an iterative approach and what happens when suppose new data comes in suppose you are doing a classification cats versus dogs and i bring a new say a horse class or something now you have to relearn all the parameters 
to you know incorporate this new information and also even if some distribution has changed maybe it will not perform well on the old data as well like a term called as catastrophic forgetting so it's it's not very generic all the the model that we train they are very task specific and what happened in the situation when we don't have much uh, data available at us so what 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 happens in that case when we are just doing a normal like traditional way of supervised learning so this may not work in all those scenarios so uh, and this is uh, this everyone might be knowing but i'll just try to lay the context here again so uh, i mean whatever things that we were able to do you know from few images or binding to different tasks we were able to do because we are really good at transferring our learnings you know it's it's like we can easily and very quickly transfer our knowledge to so many other tasks or or scenes at that we come across in daily life and this uh, this technique is heavily exploited in today's you know whatever uh, ml programs we write or applications that we develop so the idea is very simple i'll just quickly lay out we have a, a, a data sets a image net and we train a model on a huge number of classes a thousand classes and this network could be anything and now suppose a new task comes to you like classify horse versus zebra so what you're going to do uh, we we will we will not train from scratch we will use some of the knowledge from the learned algorithm from the previous task and on that we are going to then uh, restructure a bit fine tune a bit and we adapt to you know uh, the new tasks at hand and this is very famously called as transfer learning and if you see it has enjoyed its success a lot in most of the state of the art application we use some kind of pre trained network for example rcn and they use a pre trained from image net then for segmentation for pose estimations and and so on we have been using and why this kind of transfer learning works because it's the nature of the uh, deep learning uh, architecture that it's designed it's uh, it's a deep neural network and the you know the uh, the functions or the networks layers are arranged in a hierarchical manner so what is happening here is most of the real life data that we that we are observing are constitutional i means say you have any object you can break them into different shapes and different sub shapes so that's the reason like there is a hierarchy in all the data that we observe even say nlp data there are alphabets then words then letters then essays then book there is this you know constitutional uh, way how our world is designed and this is exploited by deep learning as well because it also learns features in hierarchy okay so for example for learning faces cars uh, animals or chairs so the the basic features would be like the same and then uh, on those basic simple features we build more complex features and so on so with that logic we are able to use the knowledge of those basic features and transfer it to other tasks so this is the reason now we have seen over years you know that deep learning is really good at learning representations and we are able to transfer the representation we are still able to reduce the effort of labeling like it's not like we have to train on you know huge or we have to collect huge data set by using a pre-trained image net we are able to reduce that effort but even for transfer learning we still need to bind it to some task okay we are for example the pre-trained model was an image net now i'm binding it to a task to classify yacht versus truck so whatever representation is learning it's somehow guided by the task okay it, it's still task dependent and in contrast if you see a human for example i show this picture this real scene to a baby and i drop an apple i drop a ball and i drop a uh, you know a steel locker now i will not bind any task to it i will just let the baby observe it and just by observing it will learn so much that it will not only learn you know the 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 cosmetic features like the shape the elegance the brightness uh, but it will also learn the physics and physics of the environment like uh, which object is soft how it falls and so many other things so there is so much knowledge just by observing in an unsupervised way that a child can then use it you know in different tasks when when uh, they encounter such so uh, it's it's good that we don't bind things to task so we know like a good logic is that we learn the representation and we keep the representations so that we can uh, you know use it to solve any tasks at hand can it it can be regression problem could be classification problem but currently with the traditional way of learning like we have that we need a large amount of data uh, 
and we need strong supervision you know the x y pair and then they are task dependent as, as i just talked and even if you are able we are doing this transfer learning we still need to do fine tuning and you know uh and uh as i said uh we need to provide strong supervision this labeling of data could be costly at times you know uh also because they we need people and those people need to be expert and which could be costly and they will perform well only on the task that they were trained to if some new task is coming in then we need to again retrain fine tune and all and also you know like the huge amount of uh, unlabeled data is available so uh, why we are constraining ourselves to just labeling and using those why not learn uh, you know from those unlabeled data set and it also happened in many projects that you start initially maybe the label data may not be available it, it may happen that you are able to collect unlabeled data but for labeling you know it still takes time and in some domain like medical and all even uh, we have data we have annotators but it's really tough to annotate and intelligence should not be you know just uh, you know learning this mapping of x y level so are there any alternative to this strong supervision um, turns out it's uh, there this uh, one topic that i'm going to introduce now is self supervised learning now this self supervised learning actually gained a lot of momentum like uh, while while i observed like last year and this year like a lot of papers have come up and you know uh, yan lakun and yushua benjo they are advocating that this could be uh, like key to our learning uh, key to intelligence and also in one of the blog i read from facebook uh, they called it, it could be a dark matter of intelligence and the recently very popular open ai gpt3 model they use uh, you know self supervised uh, learning to you know learn representation from this huge amount of unlabeled data so uh, just a small trivia just to um, uh, give you a, a view of how much of data we are you know producing and consuming today so nearly more than 300 million photos are getting uploaded per day as of now and there are 500 hours of video being uploaded to youtube and it would take close to around 82 years to watch the amount of videos uploaded to youtube in only one hour so these are some stats i got from this blog you can just uh, refer to it and the interesting fact over the last two years alone the 90% of this data in the world was generated so thanks to the digitalization you know we are at a place where we have huge amount of data now coming back to the self supervised learning topic so supervised learning we all know it's basically learning from the label data you have a data you label it and you train a model and self supervised learning is learning from unlabeled data so we will not be needing this part of labeling but uh, you know you may very rightly uh, question this that okay this is then simply unsupervised learning well it is self supervised learning is a form of uh, unsupervised learning but the special thing about is here that we have supervision but it's self supervised self supervised in the context that some information from the data itself will provide this supervision so we will not explicitly label this but we will somehow use some some property of the data to provide self supervision to it and this will become clear in the coming slides so the definition goes a form of unsupervised learning where the data provides the supervision now uh, how, like the general statement that you can find online it's like predicting any unobserved or hidden part or property of the input from any observed or unhidden part of the input so for example this is a very popular uh, way of training you know uh, uh, training in a self supervised way in nlp domain so for example uh, there is a sentence i lived in france so i speak and i'll put it as a blank so i will not label it for any task say translation or anything i will just train a normal language model and in the in the in the uh, you know process to predict this it has to learn the representation of the sentence the semantic of the sentence and in that way you know it's able to learn good representation and you can also uh, you know think something in the image domain so say i cover this area or i make a cut out here and i ask the network to generate this now a network can only generate this part correctly if it learns that okay this is a building and this is a structure that it follows this is a color this is a pattern so by just you know giving some uh, not labeling it by just designing some kind of this kind of tasks we are making the network to learn about the data in an unsupervised way 
and we can also do it in the video domain for example uh, you take a sequence of frames and you take couple of frames in order and you ask the network can you say that it's in the right order so we will prepare like you know uh, samples from right order and wrong order and we'll ask the network to tell us which is in the right time frame and which one is not in the right time frame so these are a few uh, things and i will further you know take uh, one topic uh, and we'll we'll try to understand the self supervised learning in a bit more detail so let's say uh, i have a data provided to you uh, there are two horse images and two zebra images and let's say you don't know what this is this is unlabeled data to you now the task is that we have to recognize the animals it could be animal x animal y we don't know the labels yet now suppose i tell okay do it in a you know let's use self supervised learning on, on it so one idea could be that we will design some proxy tasks okay so what is that you take an image you don't know the labels no problem you simply rotate it okay by 90 degree then you rotate it by 180 degree and then you do it for other data as well you rotate by 90 you rotate by 180 now what you do now you tell now the now you train a network whose task is to predict the degree of rotation irrespective of knowing what animal or what is in that in the picture okay and the model has to predict whether the image is in 0 degree 90 degree or 180 degree okay so what is happening here that in order for the network to know that this is 90 degree it has to know that this is the head position and head position should be straight this is the leg position leg position should be down and because it's not down it's on the left side it is 90 degree so by just you know doing or solving this proxy task we are forcing the network to learn the representations from the images and we are hopeful that this model which is uh, trained without any label just with proxy labels it will learn good representations which we can then transfer to our actual task so our actual task is to classify horse versus zebra we will simply do a pre training on the unlabeled data set and then because we have now good pre trained model we can use a very small amount of labeled data and uh, get a good model now to support uh, this statement okay just one ter like terminology which you can encounter so this uh, pretext task like this the task that we design are called as pretext task or proxy task and the main task that you are solving the problem your problem it will be called as a downstream task now okay uh, i think i just this fine uh, so i should have been down so this is a, a snippet from this paper of unsupervised representation learning by predicting uh, image rotations so here if you see uh, on the left side these are the attention map in a supervised way and the right side the attention map learn in a self supervised way and you can clearly see even in the self supervised way the uh, model is trying to give attention to the important features as in the supervised way so it knows that in order to solve this task of rotation i need to know where the whiskers are i need to know where the eyes are i need to know where the heads are so this was uh, you know kind of a, a a picture that shows that you know they are actually learning good representations now another uh, approach for this is uh, very popular the contrastive learning now this is uh, this is a simple idea but it has been like now it's the current trend that people are doing contrastive learning in different way but the idea is very simple which i'll explain here so suppose you have an image now you don't know about its label you do to augmentation to the images say random cropping color distortion and whatever and then you pass it to some uh, network that you want to learn from and they will give you the features or the representation now you are going to force that if the two representations are coming from the two different augmentation of the same image they should be close to each other okay so the representation from this uh, should be close to each other like they will be attracting and similarly the representation from two views of this object they'll be close to each other and at the same time you also enforce that the representation from a different image they should be repelled or they should be far apart so if i have this uh, you know this specific image this features and this uh, features of this chair uh, chair view then this two should repel and this two should repel so you can see the brilliance here that you know we didn't have to label just by doing some augmentations now and forcing the you know designing a loss function like a, they are doing a cosine similarity just to measure the similarity and then they are putting to some loss function but the idea is that uh 
just by the simple ideas, you know, we can use this unlabeled data to learn good representations from. So now uh, either you do it in the contrastive way or the pretext pre -text task way that I just showed. Uh, the idea is uh, pretty similar. We have the unlabeled data. We do this self-supervised learning on the unlabeled data. We learn good representation. We transfer this representation on the actual downstream task with less amount of labeled data. And we are you know, able to uh, achieve good results. Now, uh, like this are, uh, for example, this I just uh, uh, got from yesterday. So uh, like few months ago, I was following and uh, SimCLR, this uh, was the top paper, but last two months, so you can imagine like how new this field is. There has been new self-supervised uh, papers with or uh, transformers. And now that paper is like the top one. And a few months ago, it was the SimCLR paper. So just in two months, you know, so this field is very new. And this is a very uh, good website, which you can also follow papers with code.com for any topic just to see the the papers and their rankings on different data sets and, and all that so yeah now uh, you have like you got the idea of the self supervised learning now we also need to evaluate you know there are so many methods there are so many things how will we uh, know which is good so in in literature people use like mostly three ways to evaluate the self supervised learning model so one is the linear separation then the data efficiency and transfer learning so what is linear separation is suppose you have this data and you learn uh, you have some representation network you learn the representation so once so you have the features you will use those features to train a linear model like a logistic regression on your actual task and if so why this this is a good measure because if you if you remember like uh, this linear models like logistic regression they're very simple model just you know they have one layer of parameters so if they are doing good it's the, because they are doing good because of the learned representation okay so if the representation is good we'll be able to uh, you know do perform well even with simple classifier like linear classifier so by performing uh, by measuring the performance on linear classifiers mostly logistic regression people have tried uh, non linear but mostly they use this uh, we can know that which method gave, gave gave us the best representation so this is one uh, method and in papers like for example in this paper they have given this top one accuracy on ImageNet with the linear classifier and the features were learned from this different self-supervised learning way and you know they are comparing with each other which uh, which model did the did the best in training this linear classifier and then another is data efficiency so you have the features you train it on your specific downstream task but you don't use your entire label data you just use some portion of the label data and just see with is it data efficient like with just small amount of data how well i'm performing and uh, this image that i show earlier yeah so for example this one if you see this is a paper called SimCLR, and they are having a wrong uh, rank of one like they're having this uh, top five accuracy of 95 0.5 percent with just 10 percent label data so this shows you know that they're learning good features such that even with small amount of data they're able to achieve this much of accuracy and, and another method is the transfer learning so i mean uh, you learn the representation and then you train it for a different task you know for example you learn a representation from ImageNet, maybe you try train it for the pascal detection method and in that way also people are reporting that okay whose method has uh, performed well you know on after fine tuning you know on different different data sets or different tasks so these are three uh, approaches that people are generally there could be more uh, but mostly i have come across this and you know the self supervised learning is done in i mean all the all the tasks like in the text and in nlp it's heavily used in images and videos it has been coming up like past 2 years and then there's uh, i just came across uh, professor zizeman's uh, lecture there there is i came across one paper where they're doing self supervised learning combining the videos and sound so we will uh, and this is the slide you can go through this professor zizeman slide where he explain different self supervised learning method but broadly you know you can categorize in three sections again uh, literature is changing every time so it's not hard and fast rule but just broadly you can categorize in three uh, categories one could be the pretext tasks pretext task based like this few approaches then generative model based or uh, this 
few approaches and then the contrastive learning uh, based, which are, you know, kind of really doing good nowadays. So this space. So let's first see some of the pretext. I'll just uh, show you different what people have been doing, like different proxy tasks so that you get an idea, you know, what can be done or any, anything else can be thought about. So this we talked about one task to design for learning from unlabeled data is this rotation task. You simply rotate it and ask the model to predict the degree of rotation. Another method is relative positioning. Okay, so you cut out, you have say certain tiles here and this is your center reference and you choose any tile, say this one. And you ask, you task the network to predict the position of this with respect to the center tile. So the model would look something like this. It's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is your reference center, uh, center crop and you take this crop. Okay. And then this becomes your X, you know, pair and your Y is this position. Sorry, uh, this one. And Y is your position that it is at the third position. Now it can only predict if it, uh, if it learns about the cat that year should be on the, uh, top, top right. So in this way of, you know, designing such tasks, we are forcing it to learn the representations. Then people also use this uh, approach uh, to just validate their method. For example, they will have input patches and uh, then different methods like relative positioning or image net pretend or random initialization. Then they will do a nearest neighbor query. And if the features are learned good, it means the obtained images would be similar to, you know, the query uh, query image. So you can see the random initialization. It will obviously be ran, uh, random, so it has not learned any features. So it will uh, give you some stupid uh, images. But uh, with this self-supervised learning way, and uh, this is just uh, this is the benchmark, the say image net treatment way, which will obviously give the good good features. Again, yeah, this uh, this slide will have you know more such informations. Uh, I'm just showing here for completion and also this lecture from uh, Professor Alexi F. Rose. They, he also explained, you know, the entire journey of self-supervised learning very nicely. Then there's uh, another technique called colorization people use. So for example, you have three channels, could be R A RGB here, they use lab color space. So the input, so they don't know the labels. They will just take the input as L color space and they will task the network to predict, you know, the A AB color space. So now, you know, in in uh, in in quest to do that, it tries to learn the features. So uh, and also the you know before I said that you know we have this one pretext task and one downstream task, so we can have multiple pretext tasks. So we just use rotation in the first example. There's also a paper uh, where uh, the authors what they did instead of using one pretext task, they use rotation, they use brightness, they use contrast, they use saturation, sharpness, solarization, and then they are you know training the model like for. Each branch is uh, responsible for predicting, you know, one of the transformation or one of the property, uh, one of the property of the changes that we did while designing our proxy task. So uh, coming to the generative models, like this is very popular, you know, uh, autoencoder. We have been using it to learn, you know, the representation. So you simply have your input. We we don't know the labels, but we'll pass through our encoder decoder network. Uh, we'll try to regenerate it, and in the process of you know regenerating it uh, in the quest that it has to regenerate the uh, input data it will try to keep only those features or those representations with which it can regenerate and in that quest it learns the good features then this was translated to image as well so you can put a cutout for example and you can task the network to you know fill this voids okay so in this quest it will be you know able to generate or it will be able to learn good features and this uh, this is one and then uh, in some other paper i came across that like this i use on surround view images but people they did on satellite images that they uh, you know uh, hidden out multiple you know uh, multiple regions and they task the network to uh, pre predict it like uh, reconstruct it with an auto encoder and with that quest they were learning good features then this is really an interesting paper from DeepMind where they are learning the entire scene in an unsupervised way. So what they're doing, uh, this is suppose this is a scene and you take the uh, a view from this angle and another view from this angle, then you use this view one and view two to generate uh, some kind of scene representation. Okay. And then you take a view three and you ask the network to generate the view three for you. Okay. And 
in order for it to successfully generate view three, it need to learn about the entire scene. Then only it can generate the view three. So in that way, we were forcing the network that, you know, it, 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 it uh, learns good features. Now, actually, I will very quickly show you a small video. So this is from the blog. I have mentioned the link. So you can see uh, once they have learned by just querying any view, the model has learned the scene in such a way that it was able to generate the views for you know in different way like zooming out zooming in this way and and that way so yeah this are some interesting work people are doing uh, then uh, there is this split brain auto encoders so basically you have this uh, say two networks or two functions f1 f2 so like the lab color space that we just talked about you know now instead of uh, you know this specific network predicting the hidden information of uh, the image that we are asking will like cross swap it you know so we will ask f1 to predict the information x2 and we'll ask f2 to predict the information x1 so there are there are like many methods i'm just showing some for the time time being then the contrastive learning thing we just uh, we just talked about so uh, this was the simplest example, the SimCLR, where we are, you know, uh, doing the, uh, like we are forcing the views from similar, uh, two different views of an image to be attracted to each other and two different views from different image to be repelled out. And yeah, this is just a, a GIF from their blog. So I have shared the link as well. It's really interesting blog. This is from Google. And so uh, this is one insight from the paper so there could be you know many uh, transformations that we can try out many augmentations but in their experimentation they found that random cropping and random color distortion they were you know performing good in in this kind of task now uh, this year like i just came across this paper this very latest paper 2021 this contrastive learning which was used in a supervised uh, sorry self supervised context now they are also using in a supervised context and it has helped it has helped to learn, you know, they, the, like the paper, I just went through it and they state that, you know, they are more stable than the traditional, you know, normal cross entropy loss that we're doing. So even when you are doing this supervised learning, maybe you can also check out this paper about supervised way of doing this contrastive, contrastive learning. Then, uh, yeah, this year, uh, this SimCLR version two also came up. So, you know, it, it was obviously better than the version one but uh, i just wanted to say like this 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 whole domain is so new you know that uh, it's really hot like the, right now the self supervised learning this is another idea from uh, facebook like suave so here for example if you compare uh, with the sim clr approach we had say uh, augmentation one augmentation two and we were taking features and we are doing you know this contrastive learning here what they are doing they are doing a swap prediction so they have like the split brain on auto encoder that I, that logic and this logic they have combined. So if you see, uh, they they have the feature from one augmentation, they generate some code. They have features from another augmentation, they generate some other code, and they task to predict the uh, code of the, this this feature through th this image and the code of this feature through this image. So they're like swapping the prediction. And also they had some other cool ideas like they were using a multiple crop of augmentation and they were using some kind of clustering as well. But yeah, the point I want to highlight here is contrastive learning is being uh, you know used in a different way and uh, it's, it's very new. So again, uh, this got outdated. <laughs> this was slide a few months ago that I had. Uh, the top papers that time were SimCLR version 2, BOIUL, and SWAV, but now is the self-supervised based, uh, the transformer one. But I also want to highlight, you know, the, this topic is very interesting and very motivating because all the top AI companies like Google, DeepMind, Facebook, they're heavily, you know, investing on it. And they're having papers kind of coming out in a, in a gap of months, actually. Cool, then let's see some example from the video as well. So uh, we just talked in the introductory slide that one, uh, uh, one self supervision could be learning this temporal structure in video. So suppose if you have a video and you open it, these are the frames. So you prepare, you know, some positive uh, temporally correct order and temporally incorrect order. So 
taking a consecutive frame would be temporarily correct order and taking in consecutive frame like this one and in between they will be temporarily incorrect order now you prepare like this kind of you know a data set positive tuples negative tuples and then you pass through your network and you task your network to predict whether the sequence of image that is provided to you is it correct or not now if you think about it it can only predict whether it's correct or not if it understands what is there in the frame and what is the you know physics of uh, some actions going on in the frame for example if you if you're playing cricket and we hit a bat you know so the position of bat should be first you know at the close to our body and then as we hit the position of bat should go front so if it's able to predict this order it means it has learned those informations in an unsupervised way then uh, this were also this doing this nearest neighbor thing they found that after doing this kind of training when they do this query this is imagenet free train so we get this uh, this nearest neighbor but with training in an unsupervised way like the, the suffle and learn we get you know a Im image a bit similar like you know there's a human the arms are stretched but if it was a random random way then it would be totally different and for example in this case the person is kind of running like one leg is uh, one both legs are separated and uh, you can see here and here as well that this uh, queried were being pulled off so yeah and they measure performance and they saw that okay this was giving at least some improvement these are again very old papers so but just i want to show the uh, things that people are doing in this domain so another is learning the arrow of time so basically you don't know the labels uh, you what you do is uh, the video clips you play forward and that becomes your positive training samples and video clips playing backward that becomes your negative training samples now the idea is that again i said the example of the cricket now if if the model is able to predict which are the sequence which is going forward and sequence it is going backward then it can learn so much about our world you know in an unsupervised way and even if we were doing supervised way you know we were restricting it to learn only those features which is required for that task but in this way it can learn not only uh, you know the features that we are uh, uh, just aware of but also the various physics of our world like the gra how gravity works how the friction and how ca causality is there so those all you know multiple informations it can acquire and it will be a bit of more generalized model so to say and this is very interesting where the authors they do this from videos with sound so what they do what they did was they did a self supervision but with audio and visual so they have two tasks one is to predict audio visual correspondence and one is to predict audio visual synchronization so what i mean by correspondence is suppose there is a video of a person playing drum and we have an audio file extracted from the video and same we have a video of a person playing guitar and we have an audio extracted from here now we have to we'll design a task that just check whether the audio and the visual are corresponding to each other or not so for example the audio of drum and the image of drum would be our positive samples and audio of drum and image of guitar would be our negative samples so this way they are designing this task and then they are you know passing uh, the 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 design tasks to this network and then they are doing you know this kind of contrastive learning where the positive samples should be close to each other negative samples are you know far away from each other and one interesting then i i saw this from again uh, uh, professor zizaman's slide is they're able to localize uh, on the frame you know based on this sound so based on what they the features they learn so for example there was one audio given and a frame given so a person say uh, frame frame is this and a uh, sound is of say a keyboard or a flute and uh, it was able to localize that okay the sound is coming from this region so you can see like in unsupervised way you know so much interesting informations were being learned and this were again doing some nearest neighbor results so doing a query frame and it was able to extract you know the guitar playing or audio clips and this is the synchronization thing so basically uh, taking the exec frame and exec audio from that and seeing whether they are synced or they are not so the idea is this so uh, you know there there are a lot of lot of stuff but the takeaway from this is you know we can use this kind of self supervised learning for pre training when we have obviously when we have unlabeled data and also maybe when we have labeled data we could do some kind of pre training to get a step up you know and it could be experimented out that even in the regime when we have labeled data 
can we simply you know do that data efficiency thing that you train in unsupervised way and see that with just small subset of data we can you know learn or learn or not and then once you have this you know learned information learn knowledge we can use this pretend model for your actual task or downstream task now it it may not require that whatever i showed or maybe whatever you read that will maybe fit your application maybe you're working on some other application and you may also need to define your own pretext task but uh, yeah i mean based on what people have done maybe we can also uh, design our own pretext task or or uh, some other way of contrastive learning so these are some resources uh, which i came across uh, for the self supervised learning uh, part there are many more uh, but yeah so i will just uh, uh, wait uh, like break for a minute so oh, sorry so this was one topic that i wanted to uh, like share with everyone uh, so i hope you got some idea about like what self supervised learning is doing okay cool um so then uh, we will move to one of uh, other interesting topic that i i thought uh, could be a good good way that we can also incorporate like this self supervised learning you know we can incorporate in our daily task and then this topic also like active learning also we can incorporate in our um daily tasks so active learning is a case of a uh, semi supervised learning so why i'm saying that because in supervised learning we are using entire labeled data set in unsupervised learning we are learning from the unlabeled data set but in active learning it's like we are learning from the labeled data set but we are not using you know the entire labeled data set and in between you know the un unlabeled data are also playing a role here which i will explain now one analogy that you know i found very interesting for active learning was you know for us studying like one night before exams or anything so basically you know you have seen that our we get expert at last night before the exam and how it happens so this is a, this is just a picture of me just to represent this analogy so the passive learning could be you know that you are learning uh, you are studying throughout the year you are studying uh, every you know every chapter and and what not and active learning could be a way that we do a one night study so suppose if you have just one night for your exams what you will do you will you learn the entire chapters of your entire book or you will just focus only on the import, important questions from all the chapter so i'm pretty sure you will go with the latter that if you have just one night like a limited limited resource in our context it's time you will rather than going through the entire book you will just pick those questions or those topics which will enhance your performance which will enhance your marks and that's what active learning also does so instead of learning from learning or relying on you know the entire data set that we have it will only use those samples which will in increase its uh, predictive power or predictive performance so if you take this example so uh, say there are this is a data set like the square and the triangle and assume that we don't know the labels like you are starting a new project it's very new so what you can do like there are so much of unlabeled data set and you have some limited budget so maybe you can budget 10 samples from the square 10 samples from the rectangle and now what we do we simply randomly take and we uh, label it and then we train a classifier but just think wouldn't it be interesting if we know which samples we should label so that it improves the predictive performance of this classifier so in in terms of classification example the samples which are close to the boundary they are the very interesting one because if we learn those we will be able to learn this classifier in a very neat and clean way so that's what active learning does it aims to select those informative data samples which can improve our learning and how it does uh, we will discuss now so yeah and a situation when you can use active learning so one very common situation would be when labeling is difficult because either due to the nature of the experimentation or the budget you know labeling costs a lot of budget so if you have constraint that you have you know this much budget to label it then you can use active learning to select those samples with which you want to be labeled and you know optimize your budget optimize your resources and another could be uh, 
I mean, suppose there is this full set of data given to you, but it's not necessary that you know all data are totally different, or I mean, there could be a subset of data which represents this entire data set. Okay, so maybe uh, instead of you using every redundant data, maybe there are small representative data that we can find out and that we can use to learn, so that we learn you know with in less time and in a much you know much better way. So there could be more. I'm just listing out this two which I uh, which I just came across, and uh, just to tell what I was telling with picture. So you have this unlabeled data and you have a budget to just label six samples. If it was a passive learning, you will randomly, you know, if your budget was six level, uh, six samples, you'll randomly select six samples. You will label with annotator and you will um, train the network. But with active learning, what will happen? You will start with some random samples only, like seed random samples. You will train your network. Then you will ask your network itself that, hey, network, come on, tell me uh, which samples shall I label next so that you improve yourself much better. So the model will tell you, okay, these are the samples that could be interesting. And then you give to the annotator and you label those samples. Okay. So, yeah. So I have been talking about, you know, that we are passing, uh, we are doing this, uh, that we are passing unlabeled data to the learner. And the learner is saying that, you know, which are the informative samples and we are uh, annotating it. But how, how do we know, you know, the, how do we measure the info informativeness of the sample? So there are many ways uh, here. I'll talk about one very common way and very intuitive way. So, uh, but in general, okay, just to state, I, I found that these lines are very interesting. So uh, active learning, like you, you need not think as a, a new network or new, uh, it's a technique, but you can more of our think of some kind of design methodology, like similar to transfer learning. So you can like leverage this on your daily daily tasks by using this approach of selecting the samples and learning uh, from the informative one. And as I said, uh, the main hypothesis in active learning is that if learning algorithms can choose the data it wants to learn from, it can perform better than the traditional methods with substantially less data for training. Now, uh, there are three main scenarios of queries that you can do, uh, the network can do, you know, and ask that I want this. So one could be this membership query synthesis. So for example, here what happens that network will try to generate or reconstruct some instances from the given distribution and tells you that, you know, maybe this is interesting for me. So for example, say you, you, you are not aware, you collected, uh, you're doing a dog versus cat classifier and you collected all the dogs and cats. And when you train, uh, you see that there's still some misclassification and the network figures out, you know what, uh, this is happening because we don't have occlusion pictures. So it will say maybe we can, you know, have some occlusion pictures or, or something like that. And then uh, the common ones are this, you know, the, the pool-based sampling, stream-based sampling. So what happens in stream-based sampling is you take one example and you give it to the model and you say, do you think it's uh, it's interesting to use this for learning and then the based on the based on that you know the, the logic which i'll explain in the next slide we can either discard it or use it and this is the most common one pool based sampling so you have a pool of unlabeled data set and you get the predictions from the learner and based on those predictions then you choose among say 100 which 10 are the most important to learn from okay now let me explain this query strategy so one common query strategy is uncertainty based sampling so let me explain it with this two instances now this all that i'm explaining actually uh, i have got from this blog so you can it, it the link is given you can give her it very very nice blog so say for example now that we have two examples d1 and d2 and we have three classes say label a label b and label c okay now you pass it uh, you, you pass it to the model and the model did a prediction say it says it's 0 0.9 0 0.09 0 0.01 and for d2 it says 0 0.2 0 0.5 0 0.3 now one technique which is called is least confidence sampling so what will happen the learner will select that instance for which the least confidence uh, i mean for which it has the least confidence in its most likely label so for example in d1 the most likely label is label A because the confidence is 0 0.9. In D2, the most likely label is label B because its confidence is highest is 0 0.5. Now it will see that among D1 and D2, 
this like this is the highest probability but the highest probability is quite low so it means you know this is the sample that i need to see more and I, I need to learn from in order to improve myself so this is called the least confidence sampling so it will choose that instance for which it has least confidence on its most probable output or most likely label now and uh, one one thing the one drawback that you could see here is suppose uh, what if the classes are similar say if you have uh, say dogs two two variety of dogs which are very similar so it's so a label b and label c so they could be predicting you know probabilities very close to each other so in that case what we'll do so we can use marginal sampling so here it will not use just the one most likely label but it will use the first and second most likely labels okay so what it is going to do is suppose let's say for the d1 we have the highest label is 0.9 okay second highest is 0.09 now it is pretty much confidence that acha that this is label a so we but will uh, for the mathematical purpose we'll compute the difference between this so it will be 0.81 now we come to d2 we say uh, the highest label in d2 is 0.5 and the second highest is 0.3 now uh, if you compute the difference between this the difference is 0.2 okay so here the confusion is more that it could be label b could be label c because the difference between the probability of both is 0.2 but here the difference was 0.81 i mean it's it's very clear that it's label a so again it will choose d2 because the it is more confused about you know these two labels i mean these two classes within 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 its predictions and then the third type is the entropy sampling it uses uh, all the probabilities uh, like uh, probabilities of all the class for that prediction and this entropy is the same way from the information theory you know it tries to measure how much of information is there in the prediction okay so for example if i say that it is going to rain tomorrow there is no information is this because you already know it's going to rain tomorrow for sure but if i say tomorrow it may rain it may not now there is some information because you are not sure it will rain or it will not rain so that's what entropy does it measures that so uh, the formula is this that you know the probability into log of that probability uh, but the like if uh, if in a prediction if you are very sure about certain label then its entropy will be low i mean the information is less so mathematically we see that for the d1 it's 0.155 and here if you see uh, you know it's not very confident about all the labels like the probabilities are distributed so here it's much more unsure so its uh, entropy or amount of information will be high so again uh, by this method also we can choose d2 now there are other methods also which we can measure uncertainties and we can use it like we can also use model ensembling to compute the uncertainties you know any any kind of ensemble uh, but yeah the idea is that we can use this uncertainties to select the samples to learn from okay now uh, with this uncertainty sampling and the active learning logic that we were um, talking about now how this active learning will look like so for example uh, right now you have say five instances of sample given to you so you will say seed you know the seed or label data set you will just have some place say 10% of your data set you label it okay that becomes your seed data and remaining you let it be like let it be unlabeled now with this seed data what you will do you will say uh, uh, train your model okay now once you have trained your model then you take this remaining unlabeled data set which was there and you get predictions from the model okay and once you get predictions then from that predictions as we you know just saw that based on the uncertainties we can identify the informative samples so based on those we identify which samples are most interesting and those we labels and we put that back in the label data set and we retrain it so we can continue it uh, you know based on how much resources we can effort like based on budget time or also if, if we see that the performance is not improving it means suppose if you have a 10000 data set but among the 10000 maybe 1000 is the representative of entire data set and even after you have trained on the, those 1000 data set other are kind of redundant and it does not add to the learning so in that case for example this is one thing that we observed in our experiment so uh, after like this many iterations and this many samples the model was not you know improving basically there were redundant informations so 
this could be also one criteria that we stop our active learning uh, cycle when we see that the performance has kind of uh, saturated. So just to sum up, uh, we will simply gather the data. We will split it into seed uh, and unlabeled data sets. So the seed will be a small portion of data set which is labeled. We'll train the model. And after training, we'll do the uh, predictions on the unlabeled data. And from those predictions, then we'll choose the most uh, informative samples. And then we'll label those uh, informative samples and add it back to the label set. And then we retrain it, like we'll repeat this until some uh, stopping criteria is achieved. Now, uh, again, uh, one thing is like we uh, just to go back to the theme of what I was talking about that like in the normal way we do, you know, we have this input data and we do the supervised learning. Maybe now we can add, you know, this, this techniques, like we can do some kind of self-supervised free training. And also along with that, maybe we can also this kind of active learning that uh, instead of training everything at once, we train in a way that uh, the model itself is part of model and human both are part of this entire learning process. So this strategies like we can incorporate in our, uh, you know, the traditional pipeline and hopefully uh, we can get much efficient uh, trained supervised models with, with the strategies. Now, one one topic that I talked about, like this uh, selecting this info informativeness was based on this uh, uncertainty measures. Uh, but there are people who also use loss. So I came across one team. They they don't use this uncertainty. They use the loss. Uh, based on the loss, they select the uh, you know samples. Now uh, this paper, they mention about the loss. But what they do, uh, what they are saying that they have a, a separate module to predict the loss. Okay. Now first of all, why this could be important? Because like uh, we get the probability score in uncertainty for classification model. Even for detection, we will get. Uh, but we in detection we also have this bounding box regression so in the in those co in those cases like there are different approaches but this could be one approach that uh, based on the loss we select which samples could be more uh, informative to learn from now this paper that i was talking about they have this normal model training but they also have this loss prediction module so this is really interesting what they do is you know this is the normal uh, you know loss that we measure between the target prediction and target groundhood but they have this loss prediction module whose excuse me whose goal is to predict what would be the target loss okay and then it it tries to learn the predicted loss versus the target loss and this becomes a loss prediction module like architecture wise again i didn't go through the paper but the idea is such that we will have uh, you know some informations just collected from in between and then they were uh, having this fully connected layer to the, do this loss prediction and during the uh, active learning time they will pass the network and they will um, see the prediction from the loss and whosoever samples the uh, loss is highest they will select those samples as the most informative one okay so that was like uh, i mean this is really a big topic like uh, you know but just i wanted to introduce the the concept here so i hope i i'm making sense like um yeah so this was uh, the second topic like a little bit i want to touch upon so uh, before i move to the third topic if there are uh, some questions or if we want a two minute break like i need to have some water <laughs> Excuse me. Fine, uh, then I will continue. <clears throat> so this is a, a, another very interesting, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> very interesting uh, topic of few short learning. The, like few short learning in itself is a, it's a quite interesting domain and the meta learning so uh, i came across this technique last year i was just going through and now people are using this approach called meta learning to do this few short learning so let's see let's see how how it is done 
So again, uh, coming to this example that I showed in the uh, beginning of the uh, uh, presentation is say, uh, like this was the example of painting from the Brac and painting from the Kazan. And as human, you know, we just, few examples we are able to learn it but had it been normal like our uh, neural network models we would be needing you know multiple huge amount of you know data to learn from now it's just some terminology uh, uh, <clears throat> so that if, if you're new to this and if you go and read back so this is called in general term for few short learning uh, in many places you will see it as a k short learning so k represents the number of samples from which the model is trying to learn so if there are zero samples, we call it zero short learning. If it's one, uh, if it's one samples, we call it one short learning. And if it's five samples, five short learning. In our examples, uh, it is the three short learning because we have three examples for you know each of the classes. Now, why do we need a few short learning? Well, <clears throat> one obvious reason is uh, doing the normal uh, traditional way of you know supervised training. Uh, it takes really longer time to learn you know because we have huge amount of data to learn from and <clears throat> as again sorry uh, many of the applications for example medical domain or other other domain it would be tough you know or tough or costly to you know uh, do experimentations to collect data so we want to just learn from the few shots and also you know when uh, when we when we we have learned something and we want to incorporate new new uh, informations we have to again collect so many samples again relearn the parameters so it would be much interesting if we can you know instead of collecting all those we can learn from you know few examples and consider the cases where the classes are updated for example assume a face recognition system and there are 10 people in your lab and uh, you, you train a 10 class classifier and uh, in the in the next month some 11th colleague came in and for him, you know, you just want to uh, uh, incorporate his information with just say one or two samples. So this this could be a few scenarios. Uh, again, yeah, one more term is uh, n ways that you may encounter uh, in in literature. So n ways k short learning is generic term. So n refers to the number of classes, and k refers to the number of samples per class. Okay, so if you see this example, there are two classes. So I'll be calling it two ways and three examples for each class. So it's two ways, three short learning. Okay. Now there are, uh, you know, different networks that, that are used for doing this one short learning, like Siamese network, matching, prototypical, memory augmented network, uh, model agnostic, like meta learning in general. So I'll be talking about meta learning today. <laughs> So what is meta learning? So meta learning is popularly called as learning to learn, but let's see why it is called. So now in normal learning, what we do, we simply have say one task of cats versus dog and we do the classification. In meta learning, we are not going to train it on just one task. We are going to train it in a variety of tasks at once so that it generalizes in a, in a way that it's able to solve multiple tasks like it learns how to solve multiple tasks so that when a new tasks come in it can learn it with very few samples like one way to visualize it it's there are two level of learning going on so one level is within the task say cat versus dog here say elephant uh, versus camel or an horse versus zebra so one is it's going level one learning within the task and level two learning is across the task so the model is also learning how it has to perform well, not only within the task, but overall on the top of this task. And this is why it's also called as, you know, learning to learn. So it's learning how to learn different tasks. And if it's able to, you know, while training, if, if it's able to learn it, then when some new tasks come in, it will be in a position that uh, it can learn that new task, you know, in a very quick way, like the way we, we humans do, you know. If we learn a cycle, we learn multiple tasks, cycle, bike, car, and when we have to learn, say, truck driving, we can easily do it in a very few, you know, few hours. And one another analogy uh, that I can give is, uh, you know, again, like considering our uh, exam scenarios. So say you have multiple subjects. So one learning that you're doing is you're learning math subject and you're learning history that's totally different and you're learning chemistry that's different. Now, while you are learning, learning to solve math problem, uh, history questions and chemistry problem, on top of that, your brain is somehow learning to learn all these tasks. You know, there is, although level one learning going with every subject, 
there is a level two learning going across all the subjects. And one more analogy could be, for example, while learning all the three subjects, you figure out that if I make a, a formula sheet or if I make a revision note, I am able to recall better in all the subjects. So while you were able to solve this task, you learn a technique, you learn how to learn in an efficient way. That is by making notes. Now, when a new subject comes in, you will be in a position that you learn it very quickly because you have no, you know now how different subjects are learned. Like for example, with making notes. So you'll easily make notes and you'll be able to learn it. And that's the reason why it's called learning to learn. Now, just to uh, move from the uh, current approach to this meta learning approach, let's see this picture. So for uh, say current scenario, we have a data set. Some task could be like dog versus cat classifier. And we what we do, we have a train set and we have a test set. And we train it and we learn from the test set. In meta learning, what we are going to do is we are going to divide this full in in terms of task. So say you have, you know, uh, uh, assume uh, uh, MNIST data set. So this task one could be say uh, classifying one and two, task two could be classifying three and four, task three could be classifying four and five. And so each of these three tasks now will form this train, uh, train training set for you. This is called as meta train set and the remaining tasks we could form as testing set. Uh, maybe this will uh, again further elucidate what I'm trying to say. So for example, in a normal, you know, uh, supervised learning way, what we'll do, we'll have X, Y pair, okay? X is input, Y is output, and we'll have this training and test set. In meta learning, we are going to have data set of data set, okay? So this could be one full data set, these five classes, and it will have its training, it will have its testing. Then we can have another five as another data set, okay? And we are calling this as, you know, one task, two task, and this will form our training set, okay? And similarly in the testing set, instead of having just examples of one class, we are going to have a task, okay? So task means we will have uh, another set of classes to learn from and another set of classes to validate on. Now to, uh, uh, I mean, uh, this for this problem also in literature, uh, there are a uh, lot of benchmark data sets. So the most popular one are called as OmniGlot data set, Mini ImageNet and MNIST. So what is OmniGlot? This is the most popular one. So it is a data set of one, six, two, three characters from 50 different alphabets. So when I say alphabets, I mean, English is one alphabet. Bengali could be another alphabet. Greek could be another alphabet. So in total, there are one, six, two, three characters from 50 different alphabets. And each character is one class, okay? And, 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 and per class, there are just 20 samples. Now, this data set is also called as transpose of MNIST because in MNIST, we have few classes and more samples. But here we have more classes and few samples. Okay. Another data set is the uh, mini image net data set where we have just 100 classes. And these 100 classes then are divided, 64 are used for this meta training, 16 for meta validation, and 20 for meta testing. Now, uh, let, let me walk through uh, one example of this full process, how it happens. So assume uh, this is uh, this is your data set given to you. It's a 10 class classification problem. Now, if you have to do normal supervised training, you will divide it into train set ten, and test set. And each of these both sets should have samples from all the 10 classes, okay? This is what we do. Now, when we come to meta learning scenario, suppose if you have 60 classes, say 40 classes, we will keep it for training and another 20 for testing. Now within this 40 classes, we will create multiple data sets. So here I am using this uh, five way one shot classification. It means five examples, sorry, five class and one example per class. So my task one could be classifying between these samples, task two between these samples and so on. Okay, and these classes between meta training and meta testing, they're disjoint, they're not same so that we ensure that the model is generalizing over different tasks. So now we have this uh, meta train data, which has 40 classes. And in this uh, 40 classes, we have, you know, five way classifier. So we can have five, five. So we will have around uh, five, eight, eight, eight tasks to learn from. And for each of the task or for each, uh, yeah, each of this, uh, you know, problem, we will have further its training, its individual training and test set. So for this is the task one to classify between these five classes. So we will have training set from this 
five and test set from this uh, this uh, this problems only similarly for task 2 also we will have the training set and test set so in literature uh, people also call it support set and query set and similarly for the test data test uh, test uh, data as well you know meta test data we are having multiple tasks so for each of the tasks we are going to have training as well as testing okay now how uh, so uh, uh, I am referring to this one kind of uh, meta learning called model agnostic meta learning. It is gradient based. So it is uh, based on how there are other ways to learn, but it's based on how we are doing normal gradient descent. So now to explain from the network perspective, once we have this metadata set, how training takes place. Okay. So say, uh, you know, in, 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 in normal scenario, we will have our train set. We'll do a forward propagation. We'll compute our loss. We will update our parameters by doing back propagation and then we will have our train model called f theta f theta dash so now we will have the test set and we'll evaluate this performance on this test set okay this is the normal scenario now let's come to the uh, uh, meta learning scenario so we have you know this meta train set data set of data set which will be used for training so say we have a network you know some it could be any network and we have some network which is represented by this uh, parameter say theta now we'll take the task one and for each task we'll have our own training set and test set okay now we will take this model uh, we have a copy of this uh, this will be the level one learning okay this is our like meta meta learner but for learning within the task we have say uh, initially we take a copy of this and for task two again we have another copy of this okay now let's see how learning takes place here and then we'll see how it takes place overall so we will have our train set this is the normal supervised scenario and we have uh, have our network so we will take this train set we will train our neural network model and this will do by normal gradient descent and we'll update you know our parameters this we are calling as an inner loop and we take task two okay for task two also we have this okay so we will pass our uh, training data and we will train our model now once we have our trained model so the test you know the test of this task one Sorry, uh, we have trained model from both the uh, tasks. Now we'll take the test set from the task one and we will evaluate how it's performing. Okay, so we'll compute our loss and whatever. Then similarly, we'll take the test data from task two and we'll evaluate the uh, learned model for the task two and we'll compute the loss. Now, if you see, we are going to compute loss on test data of two different tasks and this loss which captures how it's performing like this internal one is capturing how it's performing on this specific problem this specific task but this loss across the task it will capture how it's performing you know across multiple tasks and that loss then will be back propagated and will be uh, used to update our meta learner so in that way we are ensuring that it it learns in a way that it generalizes across different tasks okay so this is our uh, this is our level one learning the inner loop and then this you know this uh, equation becomes our uh, level two of learning so we are having uh, you know uh, kind of two what do you say uh, squared of like two times we are doing this uh, gradient descent and like this is the algorithm how it looks like uh, you know we will have distribution over task and uh, then we initialize with theta then we have multiple tasks for each task we will have this you know internal loop learning that is a normal supervised way then we for each of the task then we compute the performance uh, based on the test data and we compute you know uh, our losses and that will be then used for you know uh, computing the gradient for for a meta learner and updating our meta learner so and one an analogy that you can think what this this approach is doing uh, with this this thing is uh, suppose this this is this thick line is the meta learner okay and this dotted line are individual task so by learning across multiple tasks the theta or the parameters are uh, tuned in such a way that they easily adapt to the new task with very few examples okay so if let's take this example actually so suppose if you were doing a normal scenario if there's a task one coming to you you will train with some theta and it will take some time yeah some task two is coming to you it will take some longer time task three it will take longer time but when we do meta learning we are training across multiple tasks now 
because it has to perform well on all the multiple tasks it will adjust its theta in such a way that when it has to adapt to any new task it will do it in a much shorter period of time and with much less examples so this is the you know a uh, uh, very crude level of analogy that that we can do like what's happening there again this topic is really very diverse like there are a lot of uh, you know research and it's very current like meta learning and multitask learning but i just wanted to paint uh, a few idea of what you know what what's going on for this kind of you know generalization purpose like learning continuously learning with few examples and you know not forgetting across task now these are my overall references that you can go through like this for self supervised learning for meta learning and for active learning as well and uh these are my contacts like uh for this but before that i wanted to highlight one topic like i have uh, four minutes so i know last month uh, uh, it, it, there was a con uh, report from ipcc like the climate change conference and they have warned that you know we are kind of at risk right now because of the amount of uh, greenhouse gas equivalent which already in our in our uh, planet so we as a community uh, we also should you know take this that we be aware of this and we do whatever we can from our side and uh, so i was just reading and i came across this like uh, this paper so even our ml model have carbon footprint and this is this is from this paper where they computed for one big transformer based nlp model so if you see the uh, the amount of carbon uh, footprint that was generated for uh, this is out of topic but just i wanted to share this is uh, 56 times more than average human in a year like that uh, generated by average human in a year and the carbon footprint generated by training that uh, big nlp model uh, it is equivalent to you know the amount generated by five cars in in their lifetime so this is the paper you can just go through and the idea is that we as a community should also be aware of what we are doing and how we can you know reduce our carbon footprint while training models and all and i came across this tool also that you can also use in your daily work i mean to report to just check you know what's what's uh, how much you are generating uh, and be be aware of it so it's called ml co2 impact they have paper for this also and they have created this tool where you can measure your carbon footprint and basically you can do for your cloud as well as for your uh, Uh, local hardware so this is like uh, again i don't know how much correct it is this is on average like uh, the kilogram of co2 equivalent generated uh, in india it may vary from state to state city to city but in general for example i just trained a model for 20 hours and i was able to check that it's around 4 kg co2 equivalent generated so the authors are saying that okay we need to be aware and we also when we do research or work we should also put this out so that this all you know we get more aware like in general so that we can do something about it so totally unrelated but i felt this is very timely uh, because of the talks and all going on here and with that note uh, i would like to thank you everyone for listening so patiently and uh, yeah that would be all from my side if there are any questions i can obviously try to answer